All right, this week's lecture is over oral health and preventative techniques. I'm just going to go ahead and get started. Um, so preventative dentistry. This is dentistry about uh, dentistry that is about preventing oral disease such as decay and prevention of periodontal disease. It's very important to educate the public on how to prevent these diseases. The dental assistant must be educated and you must be a good listener. The goal of prevention is that each individual maintains an optimal uh, oral health and to be effective in preventative dentistry, dental assistants must care for their own teeth uh, properly and practice good oral hygiene and good nutrition. So um, things that we want to follow is uh, brush and floss daily, disclose periodically uh, to evaluate the effectiveness of brushing and flossing, um, disclosing meaning uh, there's pink or purple little pill or that you would put under your tongue or little drops that you just uh, put on your tongue and just kind of swipe your tongue around and uh, on your teeth it will kind of be darker purple usually at the gum line where people miss brushing um, we do this for kids a lot just so that they can see where they're not brushing and um, follow a fluoride program while teeth are developing uh, good nutrition exercise uh, allows strong teeth to develop and regular visits for exams, cleanings, and dental treatments. Always recommended. All right, the initial visit. I'm not doing that. Um, we'll do a comprehensive exam and um, they want probing depths, they're going to use the uh, periodontal probe and this is where they uh, probe next to the tooth between the tissue, it's called the gingival sulcus and probing depths from one to three millimeter are healthy gum tissue. Um, bleeding is a sign of infection because healthy gums normally do not bleed. Um, on the probing depths if it's four, I usually call that kind of a warning sign, uh, and five millimeters and above is disease tissue. How to di uh, diagnose uh, periodontal disease, probing readings greater than three millimeters, I just said, bleeding upon probing, swollen and red gums, uh, bone loss and tartar on x-rays. And you can definitely see both of those on the x-rays, um, usually a bite wing, which would show upper and lower and we will get into that more um, in a couple of weeks. We do use those same x-rays, the bite wings for sure, to detect cavities between the teeth. This is how the doctors see the cavities. And brushing this is the single most important instrument in plaque control. Uh, everyone should brush at least two times a day Brushing the tongue removes uh, germs and keeps your breath fresh. Um, battery powered or electric toothbrushes are very helpful uh, for those who are unable to brush effectively. And we actually recommend that you use a, an electric toothbrush rather than a manual because it does spin so many times per second versus manual where you don't get that many times per second doing it yourself. So we do recommend you use an electric toothbrush. This is the disclosing agent. It's just a picture of uh, someone that's used it. Um, it does temporarily stain teeth in areas where plaque remains after brushing. Plaque can re be removed with a toothbrush and floss, but tartar, which is plaque that has hardened, um, is removed by the dentist or the hygienist. And patients who have had orthodontic appliances, they can have what we call demineralization. And this is where the brackets are located. So once, if they don't clean thoroughly around those brackets, once those brackets come off, then they usually have white spots on the front of their teeth. Um, this is just due to plaque buildup and, um, you know, just not cleaning properly. So we always encourage pay or moms and dads to bring their children in actually about every three months instead of six months if they're not keeping their uh, ortho clean so that we can clean their teeth so patient motivation 
uh, one of the responsibilities of the dental assistant is to help make oral hygiene a positive experience for the patient. To do this, uh, the dental assistant should treat the patient as an individual, taking into consideration the patient's age, oral hygiene knowledge, skills, and attitude, and any special considerations. Uh, this, will be a, this will better enable the dental assistant to work as a partner with the patient, to set goals, and keep the patient motivated. Patients tend to not stay motivated because there's usually a regimen that goes along with it. So um, we have to make it simple for them uh, to where they want to do this if it needs to be done morning and night. So we just kind of learn, you know, which patients are going to comply and which ones aren't and how we need to tailor their needs. Home care, again, make it simple. Um, be specific to the patient and the patient's goals. Um, encourage the patient, uh, set expectations and develop daily routines. So patients, most patients like a routine versus, you know, on this day do this, this, keep it consistent daily. They like that a lot better. There's different um, hygiene aids out there that, uh, that you can use. Again, the disclosing agents, dentifrice, which is the same as toothpaste. And we always look for an ADA uh, approval on the box. There's a lot of toothpaste out there that is not that's on the market but not recommended by dentist or the ADA, so you have to be careful with that. Mouth rinses, uh, rinses with fluoride is uh, normally better, so um, we, we do have a few different options for that. And then chewing gum, that would be sugar-free gum. So it's important for the dental assistant to be familiar with all hygiene, um, oral hygiene aids that's available on the market. When suggesting one to the patient, keep in mind the less steps involved with usage, the better, like I said. Um, we do, when we recommend mouth rinses, like I said, they usually contain fluoride. There are some out there I know that does not have fluoride. Some people just don't like it. So um, fluoride is prescribed to patients with high incident of decay and can be used for decreasing sensitivity. Interproximal aids. So this would be in between teeth. Inter, uh, interdental aids are used in aiding cleaning, I'm sorry, used to aid in cleaning the area between the teeth and to stimulate the gingival tissue in that area. Um, an interproximal brush is just a real small handle, has kind of a, um, has a brush on the end, but it looks kind of like a Christmas tree. Um, it, does have different sizes to it as well. It's ro uh, rotated back and forth using light pressure in, in between the teeth, the interproximal areas. Floss threaders, um, they're of a harder plastic and you just floss your, uh, I'm sorry, you thread your floss through it, kind of like you would the eye of a needle. Um, and this helps if there's a bridge where you would have a fake tooth, you can get underneath that part of the bridge um, by using the floss threader going underneath, bringing the floss through and flossing um, back and forth. Also, this helps with um, orthodontic brackets because with the wires you can't get down in between the teeth. You would take that floss threader in between each tooth and do the same thing. Um, this is stuff that we will show in class with hands-on. I'm just kind of going over some stuff with the lecture, but we will go over this in class so you can see it in person as well. Uh, water irrigation devices, this would be like a water pick, uh, does flush away debris from around ortho brackets and appliances, but does not remove plaque. Um, I have a lot of patients that instead of flossing, they would just rather use um, a um, irrigation device. And I try to tell them, you know, that's fine as long as you're doing something, but we would still like you to floss. A manual toothbrush, which is powered by a human, Obviously, that would be you. And mechanical, either electric or battery powered. Um, <clears throat> there are brushing techniques. You can look at those in your book and um, see the different techniques that you can use using a, a manual toothbrush. So dental floss is the second essential element of a good oral hygiene program, and this should be done daily. Uh, dental floss has been shown to be the most effective way to remove bacterial plaque and other debris, the, which is from uh, 
inaccessible, or which is otherwise inaccessible areas, which would be the interproximal surface of the teeth. And there's techniques in your book. And when we get a piece of floss out, we normally get 18 inches of floss. That's typical. Um, getting too short of floss, then you try to wrap around your finger between each tooth and then you don't have enough. So that's standard length. Um, <clears throat> the dental assistant should have knowledge of the various types of prosthetic devices in order to educate the patient on hygiene techniques specific to the appliance that that patient has, such as a fixed bridge, like I told you all ago. Uh, there's a fake tooth, so you have to get underneath that tooth to clean. Implants, which would be if someone lost a tooth and we put um, an implant down in the bone, it would then have a crown over the top of it and you have to uh, floss underneath those, in I'm sorry, underneath the crown and keep that clean. Full and partial dentures. Um, some people have a full denture. They have to take that out and um, you have to clean the dentures or the partials. And, and we also want them to take care of their tissue that is around that. And then orthodontic appliances, again, that was uh, where I think a, an electric toothbrush and obviously flossing, um, even a water irrigation device helps with that. Oral hygiene uh, for patients with special needs. Um, it is very important for you to listen and problem solve with the patient who has special needs. When working with a patient who is either mentally or physically compromised, the dental assistant may have to uh, be creative in order to meet the specific goals of oral hygiene for that individual patient. An example would be suggesting a toothbrush with a large soft handle for an elderly patient with arthritis. And uh, one thing that I remember from some pictures that we had is uh, a um, kind of like a foamy I guess you would call it like a foam handlebar cover for a bicycle and putting that on a um, toothbrush handle for an elderly person that has arthritis just because they can't grasp uh, smaller things. So <clears throat> you want to um, be careful with pregnant patients, not giving them uh, anything that we, you know, recommending something that they should not have. Um, Patients with cancer, they have a very dry mouth just due to radiation and chemotherapy. So uh, sometimes we'll recommend fluoride trays for them where we'll make a, a tray that is customized to their mouth. We'd take impressions and then they would do a fluoride regimen at home with those trays. Um, and that is just, like I said, with dry mouth, they get cavities very easily. So. Uh, we try to help prevent that. Fluoride. So fluoride is controversial, but as in the dental field, we are high on fluoride. So um, in the 1900s, this was um, invented by um, Dr. Black and Dr. McKay. Um, they discovered that um, people with discolorations on their teeth had more decay. So um, in the 30s, they discovered that there was a connection between the fluoride and enamel. So then um, in Grand Rapids, Michigan, this was the first city to uh, test the benefits of fluoride through fluoridation. And it actually reduced dental caries by 60%. Uh, it was contra it still is controversial, but it was controversial issue for many areas back then too. Um, it is important for the dental assistant to have current knowledge of fluoridation in their community so they will be prepared to answer patients' questions. So I was talking with someone yesterday, well, I was talking with someone, and they said that Claremore's water is not as fluoridated as Tulsa's water. Um, some people will not have fluoride in their water, especially if they're on well water that will not have fluoride. And at that point, if you have a baby, um, you need to go to the pediatrician and get fluoride drops for their bottles because it is very important for uh, developing teeth. Um, it's also important for bones. It's more important for a child to get fluoride than an older person. 
and uh, the fluoride affects the tooth both during pre-eruption and post-eruption. It is one of the best preventative methods for tooth decay and has significantly reduced the amount of caries in school-aged children. Fluoride makes the enamel surface of teeth harder and more resistant to decay and also helps with root sensitivity. We'll also give fluoride to patients that is um, that are doing home bleaching and uh, therefore we start them on fluoride for a few days before they're bleaching and hopefully cut down on the sensitivity. So that's another thing that it can help with. Fluoride and dental uh, plaque, it helps inhibit the production of the acids that are responsible for dental decay. It can be toxic, fluoride can be toxic. Um, the level of toxicity uh, depends on the duration and dosage of ingestion. So basically, don't sit there and just eat the fluoride. That's what I'd recommend. And it um, comes in different forms. So what we have here at the office that we send home with patients would be a gel or kind of like a toothpaste, I guess. Um, and what we apply here in the office is a um, varnish, but it comes in gels, rinses, foams, and liquids. Um, so there's several that a patient can choose from. Uh, some of it's dry mouth, some of it's for sensitivity, um, but it, it really does help. Um, the application involves a prophylaxis, which is having your teeth clean. And then we isolate and dry the teeth and then apply the fluoride at that point in office. At home, we have you use it as a toothpaste in the evenings. So the amount of benefits an individual receives from fluoride depends on the length of time the individual received the fluoride and the amount given. So the, in, the benefits could include reduction of dental caries, so cavities, reduction of need for extensive dental uh, care, primary, primary teeth or baby teeth are not lost prematurely due to decay, uh, reduction of need for orthodontic treatment, and improved bone density. And with a healthier bone and less decay, the periodontal tissue also stays healthier, so the tissue around the teeth. And obviously we get it through fluoridated water, but foods, there are foods with fluoride such as tea and fish, and there's fluoride tablets and drops that are all uh, sources of systemic fluorides. Okay, I have to go to the next slide. So next is basic chairside instruments and tray systems. So we're going to have some instruments that um, I'm not going to have here, but we will again look at these in class. It's easier to see them when you can hold them and look at the ends of them because what I hear all the time is all these instruments look the same, but when you actually get to look at them and hold them, then you'll see there is definitely a, dis a difference. Um, we're gonna go over burnishers. We do have a couple that we're gonna show you. Um, there's a ball burnisher and an acorn lateral. And there you, there are smooth and rounded heads of various shapes. So the ball burnisher actually looks like a tiny ball on each side where the acorn lateral looks like a little acorn on each side. One's a bigger and then a smaller acorn. And they are used to smooth out restorative materials or other metal surfaces such as a matrix strip and I'll get into that here in a little bit. Uh, we'll look at an amalgam carrier. This is an ha a hand instrument with a holding uh, cylinder for transferring of amalgam while in the plastic stage. It has a spring lever that is used to expel the material in the preparation. So when the doctor preps a tooth for a filling, there's basically going to be a hole there 
And so if your doctor does amalgams, which are silver fillings, then um, the amalgam carrier is what you would put the amalgam into and pass to the doctor for them to fill the tooth. Um, care and maintenance. So all instruments should be properly cleaned and disinfected as soon as possible after use. So anytime a doctor gives me an instrument, uh, if we're doing fillings, I really don't care what procedure we're doing. Um, I always have an alcohol tube or two there to wipe off the ends because anytime that gets dry on there, it's hard to get off. And then you're going to put it through the ultrasonic and it may not come out come off in the ultrasonic and then it's going to go through the autoclave where it's going to get baked on and then you're going to have to scrape it off. So it's just easier when they hand you an instrument, clean both ends, set it down on your tray. Um, if they're unable to be cleaned away, right away, they should be pre-soaked in a solution that prevents the debris from drying on the instruments. And sometimes you don't have time for that either. So um, just wiping them down when you get them back it, or right when you're done with your procedure is key. Um, instruments should be clean in an ultrasonic bath or a similar solution. The ultrasonic is, um, it is something that you put your instruments into as soon as you're done with a procedure and it, uh, it shakes the instruments and sh is supposed to shake all the debris off of them. So um, hinged instruments such as a, uh, a hemostat, something that opens and closes, they should be cleaned in the open position and should be lubricated as appropriate. After cleaning for the appropriate amount of time, the instruments then should be rinsed and dried. Um, some offices have a dryer where the instruments go into and um, like ours, for example, we put it in a dryer, it dries them, we can bag them right away. Um, but other offices may not have a dryer, so you may have to let them sit for a little bit to dry because they should be dried before you bag them. Um, once dried, they should be sterilized and stored. So when I say bag them, we're going to bag them into sterilization bags and run them through an autoclave or a statum. And uh, that is stuff that we will show you in class as well. Um, all instruments should be uh, carefully inspected for uh, use before properly or for properly functioning parts, broken parts, and sharpness. You don't ever want to give your doctor an instrument that is broken on one end. <clears throat> Dental hand pieces. Again, this is something else that uh, we will show you in class, but to prep a tooth for a filling, the doctor will use a high speed hand piece and um, maybe even a slow speed or low speed, you can call it whatever, whichever you want. Uh, they have different burrs that go into them, which is a little, uh, just a little metal piece that goes into the end of the uh, hand pieces. But we have different ones. There's carbides and there's diamonds. And this is something else that we will show you. We will show you how to load the burrs into the uh, hand pieces and how to take them out. So there will be a high speed hand piece, a slow speed or low speed hand piece, and a nose cone. Um, and then I'll kind of go over the different burrs with you as well, again, loading them and unloading them. There is a picture of uh, the hand pieces, slow speeds here. This is a metal profi angle, but this is slow speed. Um, and then there was no high speed on there, but look at that. Uh, color coding systems. This is just something that some offices practice. You will notice on the school instruments, everything will be green and white. There might be green and white bands such as these or there will be green and white tape. Um, so color coding comes in bands or tape and some offices may use it, some offices may not. Um, we use it for our restorative kits and our cement kits. So each kit, like I have one that's red, white, and blue. That way, if an instrument strays away from that kit, we all know that instrument has red, white, and blue. It needs to go back in with the red, white, and blue kit. So. Um, but your office that you get into may have 
a color coding system totally different than that, or they may not even have one. So, all right. On to anesthesia and sedation. All right. So anesthesia and sedation. Many patients are really anxious about the dental care and treatment. You will hear it at least 10 times a day of pa patients say, I hate being here. It's nothing against you, but I do not like being here. So we have ways to reduce pain around the areas that we're working, but some patients still don't like that. And so sedation is one method of managing anxiety to, uh, with the patient. Anesthesia also can be used to control the pain and patient experiences. So depending on the need, various levels of sedation can be achieved from conscious sedation to a deep sedation. Uh, our office does not do um, sedations. We use nitrous oxide, which we'll get into. So, um, but there are different levels. So you may get into an office, like an oral surgeon's office that does deep sedation. The first one we're gonna talk about is um, conscious sedation. Um, it places the patient in an altered level of consciousness. The patient is still able to communicate and respond to questions. Uh, the form of sedation serves to uh, lower levels of pain and discomfort. The patient may experience a headache, nausea, and brief periods of amnesia following conscious sedation. Next is IV sedation. This is where anesthetics are administered directly into the bloodstream and remain in place throughout the procedure. Um, the patient may remain conscious, but is in a deeply relaxed state. The patient often has no recollection of the events that took place while under anesthetic. The form of sedation keeps patients relaxed, comfortable, and pain-free. The next one's inhalation sedation or oral sedation, sorry. Um, it is achieved by taking a medication the night before a dental procedure. Um, this m is prescribed for the patient who is extremely anxious about the procedure to be done. Usually um, benzodiazep benzodiazepam is often used and can be a sedative hypnotic, uh, which makes the patient calm and drowsy, or an anti-anxiety drug, which makes the patient calm and relaxed. It just kind of depends on the patient and what they need as to what they're going to prescribe. Inhalation sedation. And um, this is may be used if it's difficult to achieve an IV sedation. The anesthetics are administered in a gas form by inhalation through a mask. This will cause the patient to become sleepy and serves um, in pain relief. The patient often doesn't remember much, but the patient is uh, much of the procedure. It is not long lasting, so the patient must carefully be monitored. Intramuscular sedation, um, it's an injection and it's directly into the muscle of the upper arm or thigh. I honestly do not know of a dentist office that does this, but I, they're, I'm sure they're out there. Um, it is not commonly used, but may be seen in pediatric practices. It does take about 20 to 30 minutes for the anesthetic to take effect uh, with, when you use this route of administration. So then you've got general anesthesia and this provides a deep level of sedation that creates an unconscious state. The patient's vital signs must be closely monitored and the patient will be on the ventilator for the duration of the sedation. General anesthesia alters uh, and depresses the patient's central nervous system. The patient will lose all feeling and sensations. Next, we have topical anesthesia. This is what we would put on a patient's tissue before they get an injection. It just makes it, um, kind of numbs the area and makes the needle stick just a little bit, um, or the injection, I should say, a little bit more pain-free. So, um, <clears throat> the nerve, this is where the nerve endings and the mucosa are uh, desensitized, causing numbness. 
This alleviates the sensation of the pinch of the needle used to inject the local anesthetic. And a lot of people, once you put the, um, the topical in and you take it out, they are like, oh no, my throat's numb, my throat's numb. It would be the same as spraying, you know, some sore throat medicine in the back of your throat. It goes away pretty quick, but some people feel like they can't swallow or breathe or something. So I always just put a little piece of gauze next to my topicals in hopes that it doesn't run down the patient's throat. And we do use it for different things such as scaling, subgingival scaling, um, so kind of below the gum line there. Um, seating crowns, we try to cement our crowns without numbing, but some people need to be numb because their, their teeth are sensitive. And um, placing matrix bands, again, we'll get into matrix bands here in a bit. Periodontal probing, uh, where they would probe, use the probing depths. Remember one through three is healthy tissue and anything above is disease tissue. Um, preparing for local sedation and repressing a gag reflex. And that is something else that I will sometimes do too. If I'm taking an impression and somebody's all worked up, I gag, I gag real easy, then I'll use a, um, a Cita cane. It's in a spray bottle and you just spray it in the back of their throat. It numbs their throat and usually relieves that gag reflex. And something else that we do want to show you in class is to um, um, where to place topical for upper teeth and lower teeth. So uh, we'll be working on that as well. Local anesthesia. This is used to reduce the sensation of pain, touch, and, uh, and heat to a particular area. The type of anesthetic works on nerve, fi nerve fibers and blocks sensory impulses. And this is what we do in the office is we numb uh, patients with local. So. Possible complications of locals would be a drop in um, blood pressure. Uh, we, I always ask my patients before I load a syringe do you have any allergic reactions to dental anesthetics that you know of? And normally they say no. The only thing they might say is the epinephrine, and I'll get into that in just a moment as to why that might be a problem. Uh, <clears throat> the patient could become ill, nausea, vomiting. Um, a lot of times if patients don't eat, they'll get very shaky with the anesthetic. Um, they could have temporary numbness, which would be paresthesia. That can last a few days up to eight weeks. And, you know, it just sometimes it happens. Um, and hemorrhage that creates pressure on the nerve. They could get kind of a bruise on the outside of their face. Uh, so those are just some of the complications that could happen. This is an aspirating syringe. This is what we use to um, administer that anesthetic that we were just talking about, the local. Um, <clears throat> there's various types of syringes. The most common is this aspirating syringe. It allows the operator to verify if they have uh, not if they have not penetrated a blood vessel. And um, so, when we say aspirating, it means they're going to insert the needle and on that thumb ring, their thumb is through there, it's called a thumb ring, but they will back up with that thumb ring and make sure no blood's coming up into the carpule of anesthetic and then administer the rest of the anesthetic that they want. And the parts of the syringe is this, again, the thumb ring here. Um, this one does not have the finger grips. Usually there's these little wings that come off the sides. Those are called finger grips. The syringe barrel is this part here, this opening. Um, the plunger is uh, this, where, where this would go down. It's just that bar there. The harpoon is at the end of the plunger. I don't know if you can see that real well, but again, we will show this in class and then the threaded end of the syringe, which is here where the needle goes. Components of a needle. 
uh, basically you're going to have um, the part that uh, screws onto the aspirating syringe. This little needle actually goes up into the carpule of anesthetic. And then as you can see, there's a couple of different um, links here. And this is what we call a long yellow. And then this one is the short blue. And this, the long yellow is usually what they would use on a lower to block. Um, so when you, when you uh, block on the lower, you're all the way at the back and it will block half of the lower. Um, <clears throat> they do come in different gauges than needles do. So like a 27, 25 or 30. And again, I'll show you how to load and unload this from an aspirating syringe when we get in class and do hands on. Anesthetic uh, cartridge components or carpule, you can call it either one. So you have the glass cartridge and then you have a rubber stopper or plunger, which is in the end here. It is just a little rubber piece. Um, the aluminum cap is here. And then there's a diaph what we call a diaphragm at the end of that. That's where that shorter end of the needle is going to go into. So the harpoon is going to end up here. So this is going to go in that little opening that I showed you on that aspirating syringe. The harpoon goes here with the rubber stopper and then the needle goes at this end. Um, vasoconstrictors. So the epinephrine that I mentioned a while ago, that is called a vasoconstrictor. That is um, what it does is when we give an injection in an area, it helps stop the bleeding, you know, control bleeding in that area. So for instance, this lidocaine here has epinephrine and it says one to 100,000. What that means is it has one part of epinephrine to 100,000 parts of lidocaine in this little carpule. So, and um, <clears throat> some people are allergic to epinephrine. Um, so we use something called, we'll use carbocaine, 3% carbocaine with no epinephrine in it. Some uh, patients just don't like the epinephrine. It makes them shaky or it makes their heart race. Um, if their heart starts racing during an injection, it's almost exactly one minute on the dot before their heart stops racing. But some people just don't like that feeling and would rather use an anesthetic does, that does not have epinephrine in it. Sometimes you get a needle stick. Um, we use a lot of sharp instruments and we use needles. So at some point you may get stuck with one or the other. Um, so what happens is we immediately squeeze the area, the needle stick, um, to make it bleed. We go to a sink, we wash the wounded area with an antimicrobial soap. We then go and notify the dentist to find out which patient the instrument was used on, if possible. You may not be able to know. Um, if it's already in the ultrasonic, you know, like ours are color coded, I could go to the assistants and say, who used the red, white, and blue kit? What patient was it on? And, and then I would be able to say, okay, we're, you know, I need to ask that patient if they'll go have a blood test as well. And we do review the patient's chart and medical history. And then we follow OSHA protocol if an occupational exposure to bloodborne pathogens occur. So what we do is tell the doctor and if you want to be tested, then we send you right away. You don't get to do anything else at that point. There, you should have an OSHA person in your office. They know where the paperwork is. There's three different papers that you sign and then you go to the lab that your doctor is contracted with and you will get, there's several tests, HIV, um, AIDS, um, uh, hepatitis, there's several different tests that they will test for. You are allowed to ask your patient if they would have a blood test. Patients are allowed to deny a blood test. So at that point, you just hope they're truthful on their, um, on their health history. And if they want to go, 
They go to the same lab. The doctors pay for that and they only have to go one time. You will then go three times that day. And I believe, I believe it is two weeks later and then like six months later or something like that. So, um, I will definitely follow up on those times and let you know for sure. But, uh, you go three times and like I said, it's usually at some place that the doctor's contracted with, um, and have that done. That's per OSHA. All right, next is nitrous oxide. And um, this is what is commonly called laughing gas. Some people love it and some people do not like it. And um, it is, it's safe, it's non-flammable gas, it does relax the patient, it comforts the patient, and it's 100% out of your system when you leave the office. A lot of people is like, oh, I can't have that, I'm driving. No, you can if you want it because we're gonna put you on 100% oxygen at the end for about 10 minutes and we're gonna clear your head and you can leave totally fine. So some people just don't understand uh, how it works. Uh, so in some states, they do allow the dental assistant to perform this task under dental supervision. Other states only allow assisting the dentist. So that would mean the dentist turns it on, the dentist puts the nitrous nose on, and as long as the doctor's watching you, you can control it. But if they're not in the room, then you cannot control the um, flow of the nitrous. Uh, patients who benefit from the nitrous oxide, they do have a fear of dental treatment or sensitive gag reflexes. Of course, you always get the patient that just likes it and they just want to use it. So, in, to ensure patient safety, their health history should be kept current. The assistant should closely monitor the heart rate, uh, blood pressure, respiratory rate, and responsiveness of the patient during treatment. So, sometimes patients will come in with Valium and they'll want the nitrous as well because they're just very nervous. So we put the pulse, pulse oximeter on their finger and we watch their oxygen levels during the procedure. Uh, but we always take their blood pressure first. If the blood pressure is high, you know, we have the doctor address that um, and make sure it's in a safe zone that we could still administer the nitrous and do the procedure with the local. So, um, it's key to ask your patient, how are you feeling? Does your stomach, you know, do you feel nauseous? Is your stomach okay? Uh, sometimes the patients will fall asleep on this. They just get so relaxed. So I just sometimes will kind of nudge their shoulder. Are you doing okay? You know, and if they are in a deep sleep, I'll turn their nitrous down. So it's always safe to, you know, safest to make sure your patient's doing good. And um, this was first discovered by a Joseph Priestley in the early 1770s. It was thought that gas was going to cure diseases. And then you had Horace Wells comes in. He came in in the early 1800s and he was a Connecticut dentist. He was actually the first to use nitrous oxide as an anesthetic, as, uh, anesthetic during the dental surgery. So I thought that was interesting. Back in the 1800s, he was using it in dental. Uh, indications for nitrous oxide would be fear. Um, again, it relaxes the patient, takes away, takes away their anxiety, and it makes time fly by. It, time just goes by really quick when you're on nitrous. Um, it's also an uh, indication for very sensitive gag reflex. It just helps relax everything in the body. Um, heart condition, people benefit of oxygen and uh, stress reduction. And then if it's a long appointment, again, if it's going to be a long appointment and they want nitrous, it will make it go by quick. Contraindication or contradictions, I'm sorry, uh, <clears throat> would be a blocked nasal passage. Because you have to uh, breathe in and out through your nose, if the nasal passages are blocked, they're not going to get the nitrous. Um, breathing out through your mouth, we do not recommend that because then it's in the air and we're going to get it. So we in and out through your nose. So they have the mask on their nose and they're the only ones getting it. Emotional uh, instability or drug users. I mean, 
<clears throat> I don't really know as far as drug users. I don't know how to pick them out. So um, I kind of rely on the doctor as far as if I'm unsure about a patient, I rely on the doctor to tell me yes or no. Um, first trimester of pregnancy, this is kind of a, uh, a controversial issue. Some times having um, nitrous, okay, some people think having nitrous or being around it when you're pregnant is a huge no-no. Um, some people say in the first trimester and then some doctors have, you know, don't mind if their assistants or hygienists or themselves, if they're pregnant, are around it in the same room all the time. So I've honestly never, myself, never heard of um, anyone having complications with a pregnancy because of nitrous. So that will be up to you and your doctor when you get in office. Uh, the equipment used for um, nitrous oxide should be monitored and uh, for safe practice and all parts of the system should be examined on a regular basis. Weekly, the nitrous oxide and oxygen equipment should be calibrated and the manufacturer directions should be followed. Um, <clears throat> I try to keep up with ours. There are what we call scavengers and that is where we're not going to get the nitrous oxide, only the patient is. And occasionally I will wear a monitor and um, what that does is it monitors the whole entire office. It's just a little round plastic thing that you clip on your scrub top and you mail it in at the end of the day, you mail it to these people, they see how much nitrous is actually in that and that you got all day long. And if it's an unsafe amount, they let you know so that we know, okay, we gotta do something different because our employees are at risk. So uh, thankfully that's not happened. <laughs> all right, so that is it for sedations. We're gonna get into some restorative materials. Um, and try to finish this up. All right, restorative materials and instruments, which I've already went over the instruments, kinda, we'll again do those in class. And anything I'm showing in this section, we will be showing you in class, hands-on, uh, because sometimes looking at pictures gets a little confusing. Uh, so we'll do this in class two. All right, the first thing we're gonna talk about is amalgam. We're gonna have two different fillings this week. We're gonna have amalgam, which is a silver filling, and we're going to have a composite filling, which is a tooth colored filling. Um, amalgams are not uh, done as much anymore. Um, so you may get in an office where you will have well, you will do them or you may get an office where it's just composite. Our office just does composite. So when we do our hands-on for fillings, we will show you how to do an amalgam and that's all we will show. Um, we are gonna focus on composite fillings. So uh, with amalgams, there's a variety of materials that can be used to restore a tooth. Um, after the decay has been removed and liners and bases have been placed. Amalgam is composed of silver, tin, copper, and zinc, and it is mixed with mercury. So this is another controversial issue. Um, we have patients that come in, I want all this silver out of my mouth because I don't want mercury in my mouth. So, um, you know, we take it out and we'll put uh, composite fillings in the tooth color. The components of amalgam can be used in different proportions depending on the needs of the restoration. The mercury in the amalgam is toxic and must be handled with care. Amalgam is subject to dimensional changes and will expand and contract. The material will also change under constant load. Amalgam restorations may tarnish and corrode within the oral cavity so they get darker and darker. Um, one thing that amalgams are truly known for is You'll have your tooth structure. In the middle, you'll have an amalgam, um, silver filling. And between the tooth structure and the amalgam, which would be the margins of the filling, uh, where it expands and contracts with heat and cold, uh, bacteria gets under there and decays underneath the amalgam. So then we have to take it out. Um, so 
If that happens, obviously it's decay and we have to put in a different filling. But that is very common with an amalgam filling. We're gonna move on to composite. Um, composites are used to provide more aesthetically pleasing restorations. They are organic polymer matrix and um, there's inorganic fillers. Um, we'll get into that more later. Um, so there's macrofill composites that are used for class uh, five rest or I'm sorry class four restorations and um, there's different ones for different classes and in our in our school uh, we're going to be focusing on a flowable composite and a regular composite. Um, let's see the uh, the composites are used in anterior and posterior, so front teeth and back teeth. Um, they are, uh, they're just more aesthetic. So even on back teeth, when you open your mouth, you don't see the dark silver fillings. You're gonna see tooth colored restorations or even if you can see them, cause they're gonna blend in. Um, Flowable composites, which I told you that we would look at, they have a low viscosity, viscosity and they are applied directly into the preparation. They can be used as a sealant for pit and fissures and they, they um, when you use the, I think what we have at class or is in a syringe looking and you'll notice it just flows right out. But once we put the uh, curing light on it, it hardens it to a very hard plastic in about five seconds. Packable composites, um, their consistency of putty and um, they are high viscous. And they are used in areas that need stronger restorations and we use flowable and packable on posterior and anterior teeth. So um, there are some teeth that we can get away with that doesn't need as much strength. <clears throat> I should say surfaces uh, that we can just use flowable. So um, we'll go over those more in class and, um, and then you can see how to do them and you'll actually get to assist with fillings as well. And what this is showing is we call this a composite gun and these are carpules of composite. So composite comes in different shades. Um, there's bleach shade materials, there's a, um, some are A1, A2, and I'll kind of show you uh, the bleach versus some of the darker ones, and you can see the difference in colors. So somebody that has really white, white teeth, we wouldn't want to give them a dark shade for their front teeth because it might not look very good, very aesthetic. <laughs> um, <clears throat> rest, uh, restorations. So on anterior resin fillings, which is tooth colored, they can discolor and uh, stain over time and sometimes the doctor can just run their hand piece with a little burr over it and get some of that stain off from around the filling. Sometimes we have to replace it. So um, they can chip and fracture just as your tooth could or a crown. I mean anything can chip and fracture because our teeth take a beating every single day. Alternatives if the, restor or the restorative treatment is postponed and decay uh, reaches the pulp chamber, then we would have to have a root canal um, <clears throat> and that just may be needed to save the tooth. It just kind of depends on how deep the decay is or if there's a break and it's down to the nerve and that is an alternative and maybe crowning it after that. Um, comparing the materials, amalgam contains mercury, which patients don't like and we don't particularly like. And then the resins or the tooth colored uh, fillings bond to the teeth and they do look like natural teeth. So um, it, patients do like that option a lot better. I'm not gonna go over these. I'm sorry, I thought these were out. Okay, next we have wedges. So we have to sometimes use a, um, a, uh, a matrix, what we call a matrix, to form the filling. 
So we're trying, if, if the cavity goes down in between the tooth, what we're trying to do is fill something that is in between a very tight spot and rounded. So I always use this analogy. Um, if you're trying to pour a square pad of concrete, you don't just go throw concrete on the ground and expect it to be a square pad. You have to build a form, such as two by twos or urban two by fours, and you build a square and you pour your concrete in there. And once it's hardened, you take off those forms and you have a square pad of concrete. So this is kind of the same thing. If we're doing a filling in between the teeth, we have to mold that and round it to the tooth if we were just to put the filling material in there, it would all just flow out and we would not ever achieve what we were wanting to. So we use what we call a matrix. And next is the matrix. So they're doing the wedges first. Um, so what this does is um, wedges come in plastic or wood and it helps hold the matrix in place. It also prevents excess filling from, well, excess filling from escaping from the tooth. It does help with um, leakage as well. If we're having some um, uh, moisture problems around the matrix, we can put a wedge in and a lot of times that will help with the moisture. And then, like I said, these matrixes and wedges are only used if it's interproximal, so in between the teeth. Okay, so Toffelmeyer matrix, and you will be learning this in class. So this would be the tooth that we're filling um, this is a matrix band around here, and then this is the Toffelmeyer. You can see this Toffelmeyer here. So, and then they've put a wooden wedge in between. So, um, when we do the matrix, you'll notice when we're doing it that uh, one side's going to be a little bit smaller. One, so the circle on one side's bigger than the circle on the other. The smaller circle goes around the tissue or up around the tissue because it cups the tooth and that just helps with moisture and stuff. And these Toffelmeyers we will learn how to use. Uh, it's just a one, one form of matrix system. You may get in an office that does not use Toffelmeyers at all. They may use what we call a sectional matrix and um, we'll get into that in a moment, but it just Again, depends on what kind of what office you get into. This is called a plastic matrix strip. Uh, this is what we use for anterior teeth, so front teeth, and it is used with um, composite. Well, we use it with composites. So if the filling is in between the teeth, we wouldn't use one of the Toffelmeyer's and matrix strips or matrix bands on that. We would use this plastic. Um, strip and it ours comes in a container like this and we just cut it off where we need it however long we need it but it's clear like i said just clear strip and they put it in between the teeth and once they put the filling material they kind of fold it over and uh, we like cure it so and in a second i'm going to go over the steps of the filling with you so that you'll have that uh, when you come to class Next is a sectional matrix system. So uh, this, again, used in between the teeth. Um, <clears throat> these are holders that um, help get this little ring on. And these look like little cotton forceps. And you just put that right in between the teeth and a wedge in there sometimes, or they'll use just this little, uh, I wish I had a picture of it on there, but I can show you that in class. There's different, um, this one does not have a little, what I call a little wing that comes off of it. Some do and some don't. The doctor usually picks those out. We are allowed to put these in and take them out just like with the Toffelmeyer assistants are allowed to put the Toffelmeyers on and take them off. So again, this goes back to whatever office you get, you get into is to what you will use. So, but this is just basically the same thing as a Toffelmeyer, just smaller. You don't have that, um, uh, the Toffelmeyer itself. And it's just a whole different system. It's a different system. So, but it does the same thing. And as far as the, uh, the um, order of how the fillings go, if we're doing an amalgam, which is the silver filling, 
we would just use bond and amalgam. So bond is like the glue, basically. Um, it helps the amalgam stick in the tooth, okay? The other that we would do is composite. It is a uh, uh, tooth colored filling. And we would, our first step would be etch. And what etch is, I call it like the soap. So, and I always use this analogy here. If you're trying to paint a slick surface, normally paint's not going to stick. So you have to rough it up and then paint. So this is kind of the same thing. You put the etch uh, around the prep of the tooth that the doctor has prepped and then you rinse it. What this is doing is you will notice the tooth will look chalky, kind of roughens up the surface um, and opens up what we call the tubules so that everything's going to stick to the tooth. So next after the etch and we rinse it, we would use bond. So again, like the glue. Um, we would then what we call light cure and we have a curing light it shines a very bright blue light and we always recommend you not look at it at that light while it's going um, and then after that we would like I said we like cure that and then would be flowable composite and then the regular or packable composite um, and between some doctors will want you to cure like cure the flowable some doctors do not it just depends on the doctor and then we would put the packable in and cure that. Um, you do that, you know, several layers. If it's a deeper filling, you don't want to just do it all at once because you can get air bubbles, which then will cause sensitivity. Uh, so they do it in layers so that the, um, you know, so that they make sure everything's cured in between and no air bubbles. So those are the steps for both amalgam and uh, composite again we'll do these in class and show you you do have uh, pictures and a uh, sheet with the names of the instruments in your binder so start getting uh, familiar with those I'll show them to you in class again and um, see that you can see the ends of them and um, not be confused so anyway uh, we will see you in class Okay, and uh, so just keep that fine. Just looks good. Um, well, um, now that all looks fine, we'll shoot it like that. Now I'm going to go ahead and record. We're recording this, and what we'll do is we'll put the two cameras together. <laughs> then you'll have to watch it. <laughs> and you'll have to tell me about where it's where okay. you're wanting this video at and you can do it by number and you can also when you do it by number of on the bottom of the screen of mm -hmm. where it's at and then you could say um, how to start when I say blah 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 mm -hmm. and then end it when I say blah 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 okay and then we'll have it on the screen for that amount of time okay but I'm recording all of that right now and uh, we can put that put that on there it's going to look good. Okay. That's that one. That's it for that one? Yeah. All right. I'm rolling. You're rolling. All right, here we go. This is for what? This is composite filling. Okay. And this is where you make the... The doctor. Filling look like a tooth. Yes. So this is where the doctor has prepped it. So there's a hole there um, where they've taken out the decay. Mm -hmm. And then they're starting their bonding process. And this is the light that I was talking about. Okay. Yeah, I don't know where the light Yep. talking about. And then... Put a... That's a weird composite. <laughs> anyway, they put a composite in there and then they're light hearing that to uh -huh. harden it up. Okay. Kind of like the company we're doing where that works on bridges and stuff. They have to oh, the cut a thing and uh, then they have to put, you know, make it a shape and a form and then they pour the concrete on it. Okay. We're recording some videos to put into this. Okay. He thinks this is usable. I know. I was like, yeah, I'm a dental assistant here. <laughs>
All right, that one's done. Okay, so I've done composite. Okay, that, that's one? Yep. We're done? Yeah.